none of these rules are set in stone. The intruder seems to evolve and react depending on your actions. How I ended up in Paul's basement didn't matter right now. All that mattered was how to get out. Easier said than done, especially considering I lost both crutches in the chaos. Well, at least the light was on. For now. Let's pray to God the bunker door wasn't locked. Leaning up against the concrete wall for support, I shimmied up onto one foot. Hobbling forward, I maneuvered my way through the maze. One painful step at a time. Tedious did not even begin to describe it. Nearly three hours went by until I finally found footprints. The same footprints from when Paul and I were down here a few days back. Something to follow. Thank God. Encouraged, I shuffled my way forward, bit by bit by bit. When... A thumping sound from deep within the maze. A fist thumping against plywood. My heartbeat quickened. I picked up pace, rounded another corner. More thumping, quicker now, closer too. I hobbled faster, my limp cast leg dragging uselessly behind me. More thumping. Two quick thumps each time now. Almost like a heartbeat. The rhythm matched the pace of my own heart. Getting quicker and quicker as the sound moved ever closer. I rounded yet another corner and... Finally, the exit was in sight. Somehow, the bunker door was open. Inexplicably open. Another suspiciously convenient blessing. With renewed vigour, I pushed forward. The thumping echoed in the hallway just behind me now. The light snapped off. Pitch dark. Only the faint glow of moonlight cast against the basement steps up ahead. Pulling closer, one painful lurch at a time. Finally close enough, I pushed off the wall and staggered through the open door. Falling, chin first, into the stairs. The thumping sound was right on my heels now. I pushed up. Slammed the bunker door shut and latched the lever down. Close fucking call. I stood motionless at the door, listening for minutes. Nothing. Dead silence. I looked back over my shoulder. The door at the top of the basement steps was open too. Wide open. Bluish moonlight revealed the foyer above. Why were all the doors left open? I turned and used the railing to pull myself upward. Another painful and tedious slog. Trying my best to be as quiet as possible. The last thing I wanted was for Paul to wake up and find me crawling out of his basement with no good excuse. After ten minutes of painstaking effort, I finally reached the main floor. That familiar smell of vanilla-flavoured cigarillos hung in the air. On my hands and knees, I crawled towards the front door, going even slower than before so as not to make a sound. When I finally reached the door, I grabbed a sturdy umbrella from a bucket in the corner and used it to push up to standing. A makeshift cane. No match for a crutch, but it beat crawling. 
I reached for the doorknob and froze. A pressure suddenly pushed into my forehead, like a migraine without the pain. I rubbed my brow with the back of my thumb, stopped, lowered my hand. That, that was the weird tick. The thing that Howie did. The thing Paul did. The thing Mitch did. When did I start doing it? Why did I start doing it? I shook it off and reached for the door. But again, stopped just short. Another question bubbled up from my subconscious. Who is Paul's so-called old friend? The person in the room down the hallway he was supposedly taking care of. I peered back over my shoulder trying to push the curiosity away, trying to just reach for the door and leave. But I couldn't. That strange, familiar, almost magnetic pull of needing to know the answers grew stronger with each passing second. I glanced around the foyer. Where did Paul sleep? Save for the basement, it wasn't a big house. There were only three doors in that hallway, and one of them was probably a bathroom. I turned fully around, stepping forward into the foyer, and lurched to another stop. It's not safe here. My survival instincts screamed so profoundly I could almost hear it. Go home. Finally, Listening to my smarter self, I turned back for the door. Go home and sleep. I turned the knob and... Another question jumped into my head. What if Zack's in that room? There's no possible way. Did the timelines even match up? How old would he be now? How would the police not have known? But if it was Zack, maybe I could get a photo, take it to the law. My feet were bringing me back down the hallway before my head even made up its mind. Thank God the floors were carpeted, or I'd have woken up the whole neighborhood. I reached the door to the mysterious room and froze. I took three deep, intentional breaths, in and out. And then I reached for the handle. Locked. I tried again. Still locked. Not sure what I expected. I looked around. The house was quiet motionless, almost like everything was on pause, frozen in time to an unnatural degree. A stillness that reminded me of the first night I found the coat rack. That same unsettling quiet in the air. Another weird thing I didn't have time to think about right now. I pulled the switchblade out from my back pocket and shimmied it into the doorframe. I've got a lot of experience with discreetly unlocking doors. Don't ask. I tilted the knife upwards, pushed forward over the latch and... The foyer light flickered on. My view snapped down the hallway. Footsteps, coming from the living room. I staggered backward, out of the hallway, into the kitchen. Hello? Hall's voice echoed. How did he get out here? Was he asleep on the couch? I ducked down beneath a bar, 
separating the kitchen from the living room. This was not a good situation no matter how you spun it. Part of me wanted to come out of hiding and explain myself. But at this point, it was probable that Paul was being influenced by the intruder. Either way, I still needed to know who was in that room. Hello? Paul's voice echoed down the hallway this time. I huddled further into the shadowy corner, listening, waiting. Paul strode back into the living room, flicked another light on. A long moment of draining silence followed. He was listening too. He was waiting. A long and silent standoff crawled by. Five minutes at least. Then Paul cleared his throat and moved towards the kitchen. His footsteps getting closer and closer until... The floor beneath me jostled slightly. Paul was standing on the opposite side of the bar now. If he leaned forward and peeked down, that was it. I held my breath, knife still in hand. Shit. I should have tucked it away earlier. Now I really looked crazy. Too late now. Paul was close enough to hear even the slightest movement. Another impossibly long silence dragged by. Seconds like minutes. Minutes like hours. Holding my breath all the while. Growing tenser. And tenser until... Flick. The switchblade flicked open. My tense grip must have bumped the switch. Fucking idiot. The floor creaked as Paul stepped back from the counter. My head raced. A thousand thoughts a second. Paul huffed and stepped forward again. Suddenly, the tips of his fingers slipped into view, gripping over the edge of the countertop above me. The bar top bent and strained as he leaned forward, pressing his weight down against it inching closer and closer to peering underneath the counter and seeing me, crazy-eyed, sleep-deprived, armed with a switchblade. Somewhere in the house, a phone, my saviour, vibrated against a wooden surface. Paul huffed again. His hand slipped out of view and he strode back into the living room, away from the kitchen. Finally, I inhaled a breath of overwhelming relief. A relief that quickly faded when I realised that my situation hadn't changed. He'd come back soon enough, and I needed to be somewhere else when he did. Mitch said Paul, his voice filled with bewilderment. No, 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 it's okay. It's okay, he said, speaking softly, comforting. Silence. Paul was listening to Mitch now, or whatever it was claiming to be Mitch on the other end. At this point... It seemed like fucking anything was possible. You sure it was him? Said Paul. Listening. When? More listening. Mm Mm-hmm. A short pause. Did you call the police? Another pause. No, no, no. I understand. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, Mitch. Not right now, but... At some point, we... We should at least get the authorities involved, okay? He's clearly not well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll meet you there. He strode back into the living room and pulled on a jacket. What in the fuck was going on here? Were they talking about me? Why was Mitch suddenly talking to his supposedly estranged father? Was that even Mitch? There's no way it was. It had to be the intruder. Messing with Paul. But... Was that even Paul? My head was exploding with an influx of questions. If the intruder's goal was to make me go insane with confusion and paranoia, then mission accomplished. Congratulations! Paul strode down the hallway again. He was coming back towards the kitchen. Fuck. 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 Fuck! He stopped in front of the kitchen entrance, standing in the hallway. His back was mostly turned to me. All he needed to do was look slightly to his right, and the jig was up. Ten long seconds dragged by until, finally, he turned towards the mysterious guest room, went for the handle and, well, it was locked. Shaking his head, he reached up on top of the doorframe, slid his hand across and pulled down a key, which he used to unlock the door. He cracked it open and peered into the dark room. Mitch called, said Paul. Something happened at his place. I'm going to see if he's all right. Back in a few hours, give or take. He pulled the door mostly close and froze. He pushed it open again. Open or close? No audible response. Paul locked the door from the inside, pulled it shut and tucked the key away back on top of the door frame. He marched back towards the foyer, flicking off all the lights as he went. Suddenly, he froze. Another long silence drug by, and then... The foyer light flicked on again. What was he doing? The answer hit me like a bag of bricks to the face. The door. I forgot to close the door at the top of the basement stairs. In my defense, it was open when I got here but I doubted that was Paul's doing. I could hear him creep across the foyer and stopped. Now, I assumed he was at the top of the basement steps, standing in front of an open door that he rarely, if ever, left opened. He pulled the door shut, locked it, and wandered back into the foyer. Then he started pacing back and forth. Pacing circles. Fuck. Fuck, fuck. He muttered. Clearly in the middle of a panic attack or something even worse. This continued for three long minutes. Until finally, he stormed out the front door and slammed it shut behind him. Outside, the bike engine turned on, peeled out of the driveway and sped away. Finally, my eyes drifted back towards the guest room door, curiosity burning stronger than ever. But I decided to wait a few minutes longer, just in case Paul forgot something and came back. Three minutes went by. I crept out into the hallway, using the umbrella as a cane. I hobbled to the door, reached on top of the frame, slid my hand across, 
and got the key. I unlocked the door and stopped. Hand on the knob, breathing deep. What if it was Zack on the other side? What if it really was just an old friend of Paul's? What would I do with the knowledge? Was my obsession for answers really pulling me deeper into the intruder's web? I turned my head sideways and placed my ear against the door. The slow and muffled beep, beep, beep of what sounded like a heart monitor. I leaned back, took a deep breath, turned the knob, and pushed open the door. A gut-wrenching stench hit me like a wall, like rotting food and burned hair. A smell so strong I could taste it. Turning away, I clenched my eyes shut and buried my nose into my inner elbow. I held there until the stench subsided somewhat. I turned back towards the room. Most of the room was hidden in shadows, cluttered with military-grade medical equipment, heart monitors, IV bags, even a table laden with surgical tools. Near the window was a tightly inclined hospital bed. And on the bed lay a man. Or at least that's what I assumed. He was wrapped in medical bandages. Medical tubes stuck out of his arms, his wrists, even his legs. Bandages covered most of his face, save for his lower jaw and just a tiny slit for the eyes. I crept forward. The slow, rhythmic beep of the heart monitor remained steady. Whoever it was, they were not aware of my presence. Yet. But I didn't care either way. I just needed to know. I reached the side of the bed and stopped. His eyes were clenched shut, as if pretending to be asleep. His exposed jaw was scarred and mangled. Parts of his lips were peeled back, exposing teeth below. Like a severe burn victim. If this was Zack, I couldn't tell. He would have been so much older now anyways. But whoever it was, they looked fit for an intensive care unit, not a guest bedroom. Was Paul keeping them here as a guest to ward off the intruder? I couldn't imagine anyone in their right mind agreeing to this willingly. I was about to turn back when my eyes caught something. His wrist was handcuffed to the bed. His wrist was handcuffed to the bed and... Out the hallway, the front door clicked open and a light flicked on. Paul was back. I cast my view around the room, desperately searching for a place to hide when... The man on the bed's eyes snapped open. Cold, blue eyes. Strikingly similar to Paul's. He was looking straight at me. Wide and fearful. Thudding footsteps getting closer. Without thinking, I clambered beneath the bed and pulled my cast leg in behind me cramped between tangled wires and green metal crates. The footsteps stopped in the doorway. The bedroom light flicked on. How did you open this? 
Paul's voice reverberated into the room. No response. What's wrong? Said Paul. Again, no audible response. Paul huffed, flicked the light off, and pulled the door shut, leaving me alone with the burn victim. The burn victim that I'm pretty sure was Paul. Or at least some version of him. <laughs>